So good afternoon to all. Uh, today I will discuss the case of the month. So uh, patient is a 30-year-old male child, Mr. S, studying 7th oh. standard, hailing from uh, Kannatu, Reddy Kupam. He was admitted on uh, 24th of uh, March at 9 a.m. Um, with alleged, alleged history of an unknown bite, probable snake bite, over the right uh, malleola region near Kannatur Beach where he was playing with his friend. Uh, initially, he was taken to a private hospital where uh, TT was administered and he was taken back home because he did not have any symptoms. At around 6 p.m. on the very same day, he developed myalgia and fatigue. So he was taken to another private hospital where routine baseline investigations were done, which revealed uh, normal creatinine, uh, creatinine phosphokinase of 5000 and urine analysis showed granular casts. So he was referred to RGGH for further management. He presented to us on the 25th of March in the early morning around 12 10 a.m. On general examination, he was conscious oriented, vitals BP 180 millimeters of mercury. Uh, seen as no focal deficits, and the very small, tiny fan marks were seen near the right malleolus with uh, no local reaction at the site of the bite. Uh, basic investigations revealed the positive finding of a creatinine phosphokinase level of 73,000, OTPT of 2,940 and 594, and LDH value of 2,500. Uh, urine routine showed new narrowing of trees, no active de deposits. Urine myoglobin was positive. So, on suspicion of um, Sea snake associated rhabdomyolysis and nephrology concerns were sought by the medicine department. Uh, so we are at least for uh, IV hydration with normal saline, at the rate of 250 ml per hour. And uh, we are at least for post alkaline diuresis with 500 ml of normal saline over one hour, followed by 500 ml of 5% dextrose with 100 uh, millimoles of soda bicarb, and followed by uh, 500 ml of uh, normal saline with 10 ml of ACL with the uh, routine monitoring of intake output. Creatinine, potassium, calcium, phosphorus, and uh, phosphokinase, which was done serially. A total of 11 cycles of uh, post alkaline diuresis was given to the patient. Uh, so, this was a spectrum of uh, investigations serially done. So, from the initial uh, creatinine phosphokinase of around 70,000, the progressive decrease in the creatinine phosphokinase 5,000, 19,000, 11,000, 4,000, and towards the end, before discharge, it was around uh, 200. Uh, Serially, OTPP, LDH, calcium, phosphorus were also monitored. Uh, his creatinine uh, remained in the baseline of around 0.4 to 0.5. He was discharged in a stable condition after 11 cycles of fat with the uh, uh, discharge value of 0.5, creatinine phosphokinase of 241, OTPP of 60 by 90, and LDH of 160. His stay during the hospital was uneventful, discharged in a stable condition. So, this was a uh, case of sea snake associated rhabdomyolysis treated with IV hydration and post alkaline diuresis. So, moving on to the discussion. Uh, so, sea snakes, there are 57 species and two subfamilies of sea snakes. Sea snakes generally are not very aggressive, they tend to be very dormant, and uh, usually, whenever they are startled or surprised, only then does a bite occur. So, most uh, common conditions in which bite occurs is when the fishermen try to remove the snake from the uh, uh, fishing net and uh, the bites are also very inconspicuous because they have very tiny fangs. So most of the time the bite uh, goes unnoticed until the patient starts developing some symptoms. Also there is not much of local reaction, inflammation or swelling. So uh, because of all these reasons, so most of the time they don't uh, realize that a bite has occurred. So this was the case in this patient also. He did not know that there was a snake bite. Uh, only on retrospectively uh, analyzing that he was son of a fisherman and there was sea snakes in the fisherman net, which was suspected it would probably be a sea snake. He was actually showed the photograph and asked how the snake looked. He was positive that it was around black and yellow. So it was suspected to be a sea, sea snake. Uh, so sea snake venom generally have multiple enzymes, as is acetylcholinesterase, hyaluronidase, leucine aminopeptidase, fibrin nucleotidase, phosphomonesterase, phosphodiesterase, and phospholipase. So the venom acts at both the presynaptic as well as the postsynaptic level. Phospholipase C acts at the presynaptic level. Initially, it causes an increase in the release of acetylcholine, but progressively later on, it causes inhibition of the enzyme. Uh, postsynaptically, there is a small toxin, not yet identified, which uh, actually inhibits the acetylcholine receptors. So even if acetylcholine is released in the initial period, because uh, uh, postsynaptic receptors are blocked, there is uh, no transmission of a neural impulse which causes neurological symptoms such as muscle paralysis. So the symptoms usually start occurring around 2 to 3 hours following the bite. 
uh, initially there is uh, myalgia, weakness, fatigue because of the uh, myonecrosis. And later on, once neurological symptoms start occurring, patient can have uh, doses, muscle paralysis, respiratory muscle weakness in the respiratory failure. Um, phospholipase is the enzyme which is responsible for the myonecrosis. So this is rhabdomyosis associated with C snake. Rhabdomyosis symptoms usually start occurring three to six hours following the break. So moving on to the discussion about rhabdomyolysis in general. Uh, so there can be both traumatic and non-traumatic causes for rhabdomyolysis. In the traumatic causes, usually it is uh, road traffic accidents with multiple injuries, crunchy injuries, or it can be associated with vascular or orthopedic procedures which involve prolonged immobilization of the limb or application of a tourniquet, which can cause vascular occlusion and myonecrosis. And patients who have certain neurological disorders or in prolonged immobilization or coma can also develop a traumatic uh, or compressive uh, rhabdomyolysis. Compartment syndrome can be both a cause as well as a consequence of rhabdomyolysis. So whenever there is a trauma, they have closed the compartment. Uh, when the intracompartment pressure increases, can uh, occlude the vascular uh, supply to the muscle and can produce compartment syndrome. Also, high voltage electrical injuries such as lightning can also be associated with rhabdomyolysis. In the non-traumatic causes, they can be classified as exertional or non-exertional. Following an exertional uh, rhabdomyolysis, it can occur either in a normal muscle or in an abnormal muscle. When the muscle is normal, it usually occurs uh, in the case of an extreme unaccustomed, unaccustomed exertion, especially when it occurs in an environment with severe heat, with excessive sweating. It can also occur in patients with sickle cell trait and following seizures, especially status epileptics. In abnormal muscles, there are multiple metabolic myopathies like your canton phosphate transfer deficiency, uh, myophosphorus deficiency or mechanic disease and uh, phosphorus deficiency, which can be associated with uh, rhabdomyolysis following minimal exertion, fasting, or an intercurrent viral illness. And there are two other causes, medical hyperthermia and neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So in medical hyperthermia, we have abnormal rhinodine receptors. Uh, so when these patients are exposed to inhalation anesthetic agents, just halopane, there can be excessive release of uh, calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, can cause excessive muscle contraction, producing the abdomyolysis. In neuroleptic um, malignant syndrome, it is usually associated with uh, uh, antipsychotics both typical as well as atypical antipsychotic, where there is excessive muscle contraction, muscle rigidity, hyperthermia, leading on to rhabdomyosis. Among non-exertional causes, there are multiple factors, such as alcoholism, uh, drugs like heroin, cocaine, amphetamines, LSD, and statin-associated rhabdomyolysis. In alcoholism, there are multiple factors which can produce rhabdomyolysis. First is complete alcohol intoxication. Patient can be found down for prolonged periods of time, which can cause rhabdomyolysis. As well as, um, Electrolyte abnormalities following alcohol ingestion, hypokalemia, hypophosphatemia can also be disposed to rhabdomyolysis. Okay, but statins, we know statins is an important cause for rhabdomyolysis. There are multiple uh, mechanisms that have been proposed for statin associated rhabdomyolysis. It interferes with energy metabolism so that um, when the body needs to switch over from a glucose to a fatty acid based uh, energy consumption, that does not occur and patient can go for rhabdomyolysis. Another important cause, especially in the critical care ward, is propofol infusion syndrome. Uh, when patients are on prolonged propofol infusion, more than 4 mg per kg per hour for more than 48 hours, they can go in for propofol infusion syndrome. Again, it has been proposed that propofol causes uh, disruption of oxidative phosphorylation. It uncouples oxidative phosphorylation so that there is depletion of ADP, which causes muscle ischemia and rhabdomyolysis. Infections, such as influenza, coxsackie, EPD, HSV, pyomyositis, and COVID also has been associated with rhabdomyolysis. The reason now for COVID is rhabdomyolysis mechanism is not exactly known. We want to electrolyte abnormalities. The most important are hypokalemia, hypophosphatemia, and hypocalcemia. So, in hypocalcemia, uh, in hypokalemia, so potassium is a very important factor which causes the vasodilatation of muscle uh, vasculature. It is very important to increase the blood supply to the muscle at times of uh, exertion. So, there is a pre existing hypokalemia. At the time of exertion, uh, there can be uh, muscle ischemia uh, because of uh, demand uh, mismatch and then that can be disposed to rhabdomyolysis. Also, hypophosphatemia and hypocalcemia can cause rhabdomyolysis. And inflammatory myopathies like dermatomyositis and polymyositis also can cause rhabdomyolysis. And miscellaneous causes, the most important are carbon monoxide poisoning, snake bite, as well as basps and bee stings. So when a patient has rhabdomyolysis, the initial symptoms will be uh, muscle pain, myalgia, weakness, and patient can sometimes complain of a 
dark urine or a cola colored urine. Um, so these symptoms usually start occurring three to six hours following the uh, inciting event. So the workup or the basic investigations need to be done are based on investigation. The most important investigation is the creatinine phosphokinase level. Uh, so creatinine kinase is released from the uh, damaged muscle. So it starts uh, increasing around three to six hours when the symptoms start again. But not uh, uh, all patients with creatinine kinase elevation can have myoglobinemia. So the uh, thing here is creatinine kinase. Uh, the peak level of creatinine kinase does not have any correlation with the development of AKA or the severity of AKI. Previously, they were trying to measure serum myoglobin level for rhabdomyolysis, but it is a very insensitive measure because it has a very unpredictable and erratic uh, clearance from the uh, serum. And so the myoglobin level can even be normal when the patient is having severe rhabdomyolysis. Next is transaminases like uh, SGOD and NCPD can also be increased because they are also found in uh, muscle. And uh, next is myoglobinuria. So uh, not all patients with abdomyolysis will have myoglobinuria. This is because uh, whenever myoglobin is released, it is initially taken up by the proximal convoluted tubules and it is metabolized. So only when a, a renal threshold of 0.5 to 1.5 mg per deciliter is exceeded, that start occurring, uh, start appearing in the urine. For it to produce a discoloration of urine and to produce a dark colored urine, the serum concentration or has to be more than 100 mg per deciliter. So even patients with rhabdomyolysis, with the creatinine kinase elevation, can still have a, no a normal or a negative urine myoglobin. The other complications of uh, uh, rhabdomyolysis is uh, the peptide abnormalities. The most important thing which occurs initially is severe hypovolemia. So the reason for this hypovolemia is when the muscle is damaged, myoglobin is released. Myoglobin itself can directly cause um, endothelial injury and uh, cause vascular leakage. Plus when the muscle is damaged, there is excessive third space fluid loss. Fluid starts accumulating within the damaged muscle, and this cause can cause even hypovolemia. Uh, next is uh, the electrolyte abnormalities. So, most important are hyperkalemia. So, we know intracellular potassium level is very high. So, when the muscle starts slicing, there is hyperkalemia. There is also hyperphosphatemia. So, when this hyperphosphatemia starts uh, combining with serum calcium level, so the calcium phosphate deposits can get deposited in the necrotic muscle, which can produce a hypocalcemia. So the other reason for hypocalcemia is for hyperphosphatemia decreases your active form of vitamin D. So this can also cause a decreased level of calcium. On the whole, initially there is a period of hypocalcemia and rhabdomyolysis. But the thing to be remembered most is during the recovery time of rhabdomyolysis, there is rebound hypercalcemia. It's very unique to very unique to rhabdomyolysis induced age. So this hypercalcemia at the recovery stage is because one is because of the release of calcium back from the muscle, which was earlier deposited. Second is, uh, when the hyperphosphatemia starts correcting, the calcium level starts going back, and that can also cause the rebound hypercalcium. So this is very important because during management, you don't treat all hypocalcemia just based on the vanish. Only when it is symptomatic, you try to correct the calcium. Next is, uh, there is also hyperuricemia, and uh, um, this is because of the uh, release of uh, Purines which are converted to uric acid and a high anandia metabolic response. Like I said, compartment syndrome can be both a cause as well as a consequence of rhabdomyolysis. So when a muscle starts slicing and it is within a closed compartment, so the swelling of the muscle due to third space fluid loss can also compromise your vasculature, leave the compartment syndrome, which can further worsen your rhabdomyolysis. Next is when the muscle starts slicing, there will be release of intracellular thromboplastin and other prothrombotic factors, which can lead to disseminated intravascular coagulation. So whenever the suspect the patient could have a metabolic myopathy is whenever the patient has recurrent episodes of rhabdomyolysis, especially with minimal exertion during times of fasting or intercurrent viral illness, or the patient or the patient since childhood has excess intolerance with recurrent rhabdomyolysis associated with uh, pigmenturia, and also when there is a very strong family. So moving on to our area of uh, interest, which is acute kidney injury. Um, also, the other thing is um, in urine analysis, generally you find pigmented uh, granular casts and uh, the fractionization of sodium, which generally tends to be less than 1% is indicating that it is the free glomerular vasoconstriction is a more important factor rather than acute tubular thickness, which is seeing about the chart. So, um, so whenever you have a patient with a red or a brown urine, first thing you do is you centrifuge the urine. So when the sediment is red, it means that it is a hemorrhage urine. When the super is red, it has to be either hemoglobin, myoglobin, 
or due to some other causes, which can cause uh, discoloration of the youth. So you proceed with the adistic heme test. The adistic heme test is positive. It is either hemoglobin or myoglobin, which can be differentiated based on the color of the plasma. If the color of the plasma is red, it is hemoglobinuria. If it is clear, it is myoglobin. And initially, if the diffusic heme itself is negative, it can be due to other causes which can cause discoloration of the urine, the consumption of weed root and the drugs like phenosopyrin, rifampicin, peritoin, and porphyrin. So moving on to how rhabdomyolysis causes AK. So the first thing is your muscle starts slicing. So normally the membrane stability of any uh, organ or tissue or cell is maintained by the uh, pumps which are there in the membrane. So whenever the sarcolemmal sheath is damaged, your normal uh, pumps which are there in the membrane will stop functioning. So the sodium potassium A base pump stops functioning. So sodium starts accumulating within the uh, muscle cell. So this will activate your sodium calcium exchange. So trying to push the sodium out of the muscle. In turn, it will take calcium inside. So calcium starts accumulating within the muscle. But your calcium ATP is pumped in order to push the calcium back outside is ATP. But there will be ATP depletion once your muscle starts slicing. So without ATP, the calcium cannot go outside. The calcium starts accumulating within the muscle. This causes excessive muscle contraction. As well as there are multiple calcium dependent enzymes or proteins which are there inside the cell which will get activated which will cause destruction, further destruction of the membrane leading to muscle lysis. Uh, the next is, as I said, your hypovolemia. So whenever myoglobin is released from the muscle, it can cause direct increased vascular permeability, causing interstitial edema and hypovolemia. Also, there have been certain animal studies which have shown that there is an imbalance between the vasoconstrictors and vasodilators. There is excess of endothelin, uh, thromboxic A2, Hemorrhagic factor alpha, whereas there is a deficiency of nitric oxide, so which tips the balance towards more of vasoconstrictors. So, all these things will stimulate your uh, renin angiotensin aldosterone system, your sympathetic nervous system, as well as vasopressin, all of which will cause renal vasoconstriction, further worsening your renal ischemia. So, the next mechanism is direct toxicity by myoglobin. So, whenever myoglobin is released, that will be the filtrable substance, be filtered by the coronavirus. And it is normally metabolized by the proximal capillary tubule cells. So it will be taken up into the proximal capillary tubule cell by a uh, transporter complex, which has three components: cubulin, megalin, as well as amniotics. So through this, your uh, myoglobin moiety or heme moiety will go inside the proximal capillary tubule cells. Uh, so once the uh, once it enters into the cell, there are multiple mechanisms which will either metabolize or store the heme moiety component of the myoglobin. So either your uh, Fe2 plus, which is part of the heme multi, can convert to Fe3 plus and get stored in the cell. Or uh, there is also some amount of free radicals or hydroxyl radical ion production, production through the Fenton's reaction. This is also normally scavenged by your intracellular antioxidant mechanism. But whenever there is excess of myoglobin is released, and in the case of rhabdomyolysis, what happens is this Fe, um, this normally should be converted by heme oxygenase 1 in there carbon monoxide, billy burden, as well as iron. And this iron can get stored. So all these novel protective mechanisms will get overwhelmed. Heme oxygenase cannot convert all the heme that is coming inside um, to uh, innocuous products. Next is, there will be more amount of Fe2 plus production. It cannot be stored as Fe3 plus or ferritin. Also, normal antioxidant mechanisms will be overwhelmed. So all this causes production of hydroxyl radicals and reactive oxygen species, uh, which is redox cycling. And this can cause either direct cell injury as well as it causes peroxidation of the uh, lipid membrane, cell membrane. So all this causes further renal tubular cell damage. Uh, so this all suffers the proximal condition. The other area of injury by myoglobin is in the distal tube. So when myoglobin passes through the cassering liver group of Indy, it can combine with Tom hospital protein and it can form casts and it can precipitate it, which can cause tubular obstruction downstream in the distal tube. So there are two major uh, sites of injury. One is in the proximal condition tube, the other one is in the distal tube. So these uh, Tom Morton protein precipitates generally tend to occur in acidic pH. So this is pH dependent uh, precipitation in the distal tube, causing tubular obstruction. And that is also one mechanism for uh, renal injury in rhabdomyolysis. So whenever we see a patient with rhabdomyolysis, um, so these are the steps for prevention as well as the treatment. Initially assess the volume status of the patient and the urine output, measure serum creatinine kinase level, and you have to monitor uh, creatinine. Potassium, sodium, calcium, phosphorus, uric acid, and alpha. So, we start uh, initiating volume repletion with normal saline at the rate of around 400 ml per hour. It can vary from 200 to 1000 ml per hour 
depending upon the severity of the abdomen. You tend to target the urine output of 3 ml per kg body weight per hour, around 200 to 300 ml per hour. Um, and they already said, you correct the hypocalcemia only if it is symptomatic, either it's tetanic or seizures or if there is recipient hypokalemia because the hypocalcemia can worsen the arthmogenic effects of hypercalcemia on the cardiac. Um, next is the addition of sodium metta, where your alkaline diuresis comes in. So what is the role of alkalinizing the urine is? There are, as I already said, uh, the precipitation of myoglobin uh, casts, speech dependent process. So when you add sodium bicarbonate and try to uh, alkalinize the urine, first thing is you prevent the precipitation of further myoglobin casts. Second is alkalinization of urine has been shown to inhibit the redox cycling of iron. So that the reactive oxygen species induced proximal tubular damage can be brought under control. So the uh, post alkaline dialysis uh, protocol we use here is uh, final level of normal line over one hour, followed by final level of 5% next to 100 millimoles of bicarbonate over one hour, followed by 500 ml of NS with uh, 10 ml of in. So in any of the uh, most of the articles, the protocol advised is actually one liter of saline alternated with one liter of 5% exposed with 100 millimoles of bicarbonate. We generally tend to target the urine pH of at least 6.5. If the urine pH is less than 6.5, you can continue your fat. Uh, if rhabdomyolysis, the other thing to be monitored is your, uh, apart from electrolyte, is your serum CPK level. So it is generally advised that you can stop uh, post alkaline diuresis. Once your pH crosses 6.5, or patient develops symptomatic hypocalcemia, because if you give bicarbonate, your ionized calcium further decreases, and the patient can go for symptomatic hypocalcemia. Or your CPK level is less than 5%. Next is there have been studies which have tried uh, using mannitol as an osmotic diuretic to prevent AKA in patients with rhabdomyolysis. So the role of mannitol here is for this an osmotic diuresis, it increases the urine flow rate, so there is less contact time for myoglobin, the proximal control diuretic, and decreasing the uh, renal tubular damage. Next is there is an osmotic agent that will create a gradient between the muscle and the vasculature so that the uh, third space fluid loss which occurred into the muscle, the water will start moving back into the vasculature. That is the second mechanism. Third mechanism is mannitol itself is a free radical scavenger. But when you give mannitol, you are supposed to uh, monitor the plasma osmolality, the osmolal gap, as well as whether the patient is diuretic. Whenever the uh, osmolal gap crosses 55 milliosmos per kg, or the patient is not diuretic, your output is less than 20 ml per hour, you have to stop mannitol and continue only normal sign with sodium. Also, when you give soda bicar, if the urine pH does not rise, by 4 to 6 hours, does not cross 6.5, it is better to stop that and continue with only normal. Uh, so, um, make sure that you maintain a proper volume depletion until your myoglobin is cleared, both by measuring the urine, uh, myoglobin, uh, clear urine, as well as by district testing for uh, early. Uh, so, whenever a patient has hyperkalemia, uh, the normal, usual uh, mechanism for combating hyperkalemia can be tried in the initial phase where uh, you give uh, calcium gluconate insulin with dextrose, the those can be tried, but once the hyperkalemia becomes resistant or patient starts uh, becoming oluric, oluric or anuric, you tend to go for renal replacement therapy. In renal replacement therapy, a conventional hemodialysis simply does not remove myoglobin to such an extent. So mostly continuous venovenous hemofiltration or hemodia filtration is preferred because myoglobin size can be removed to some extent through uh, CRRT procedures. But we have to use a high flux dialyzer with a high uh, ultra filtration to have a good clearance. So this is actually a validated scoring system called the McMahon scoring system, which is used to assess patients who have rhabdomyolysis, who have a risk of developing RRT requiring AKA. So here uh, the uh, um, parameters which are studied are age, sex, and the cause of the rhabdomyolysis, and uh, baseline parameters of creatinine, calcium, creatinine phosphokinase, bicarbonate, and phosphate. So whenever the score is more than 6, there is a 52% chance of patient going in for an RRT requiring AKA. Uh, so, the new area of uh, mechanism of uh, AKA in rhabdomyolysis is immune mechanism. Uh, so, we have done the multiple animal studies in rat by injecting glycerol and producing rhabdomyolysis and studied the possible role for immune mechanisms for uh, both the mechanisms as well as possible therapeutic targets for you to uh, prevent AKA before it starts happening. So, the most two important cells which have been studied are one is a neutrophil, the other one is a macrophage. Uh, so, whenever there is rhabdomyolysis, the intramuscular uh, substances which are released, both from the muscle as well as from the renal injury tubular epithelial cells, both of them can act as immunogenic damage associated molecular patterns and this can stimulate your immune system. So, the immune system gets activated 
It will activate the resident macrophages as well as the neutrophils to release multiple cytokines, which can uh, cause cell damage. So, actually, the resident macrophage actually has the protein 1 beta receptor, activation of which causes release of cytokines as well as formation of macrophage extracellular traps, which are very similar to your neutrophil extracellular traps. So, the most important uh, um, integrin or substance needed for formation of the extracellular trap is your MAC1. So, this MAC1 has also been studied. Uh, they have done animal studies, the MAC negative uh, rat, in which production of rhabdomyolysis by injecting glycerol did not produce AKA in patients who were MAC negative. So, the MAC is an integrin which is supposed to actually uh, help binding of platelet glucose. So, whenever there is rhabdomyolysis, they have found that heme activates platelets. And this heme activated platelet in turn can activate leukocytes, both neutrophils as well as macrophages, leading to the formation of neutrophil extracellular traps as well as macrophage extracellular traps. So, we have tried lactoferrin, which is actually a Mac1 inhibitor, to prevent formation of these extracellular traps. And uh, there have been some uh, positive uh, effects in using lactoferrin. Uh, for the release of macrophage cytokines as well as formation of extracellular traps has been decreased. So, we, all, all these are drugs which are being tried as therapeutic targets to prevent development of AK in patients with rhabdomyolysis. You can target interleukin 1 receptor with anakimbra, interleukin 1 beta with canakinumab, interleukin 17 with secukinumab, and lactoferrin as a MAC1 inhibitor. 